Yo, 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 everybody, what's going on? Welcome to episode 50 of Climbing the Ladder. I'm your host, Chan Man V. And joining me, as always, is Mr. Mountain Man over here, John Clark. What's going on, John? Check out the beard. <laughs> it's all gray. Awesome, awesome. And uh, we'd like to welcome our new, uh, our new guest, uh, John's twin brother, Mr. Uh, Richard Lewis, editor in chief of Cadre.org and a long time, long time esports veteran. What's up, Richard? Uh, yeah, th it's great. I didn't even realize how much of a twin I was, like until because <laughs> I have this vision of like John from like way back in my head, and then like when we actually both got on the Skype call a day, I was like, is that my window or oh no, wait, that's John. <laughs> so I was like, it, it, it's 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 kind of awkward, I guess. Let's Accents make sure. Or... Let's make sure we coordinate not wearing the same shirt. We definitely need to do so, that. Like. So, so uh, eight, ten years ago, you guys both have more hair? Uh, yeah. yeah. All right, who has a picture? I want If anybody out there has a picture of these two guys with hair, like, I, I, I definitely want to see this. Facebook, you can check it. You can check my Facebook. I'll find a link for it. It's embarrassing, but I'll find it. I had really cool hair. I used to have hair as long as Slasher used to, dude. Like, Same hair. Oh, my I God. Wow, it. wow. Yeah, for real. Like, okay, awkward. But, Awkward. In the '90s, when you used to listen to Nirvana and stuff. Yeah, exactly. Like, we mean you know. in the '90s, but <laughs> but seriously, Richard, uh, you know it's a real pleasure having you join us on on the show, and uh, you're going to be a great addition to the show, and we're going to have some fun every week, buddy. Well, let, let, let's hope I'm a great addition. Let's not oversell it. <laughs> what? Let's, let's, let, let's just see how it goes. Uh, but yeah, of no, course you're going to be a great addition. I wouldn't add you if not, right? I mean. <laughs> I'm a, I've been a, been a long-standing fan, so uh, hopefully it'll work out. I'm sure it will. It's going to be awesome, awesome. And our guest this week. Uh, so a little backstory with our guest is I've been trying to get him off for a long time. Um, you know, but you know, me and him can. Uh, definitely attest to that uh, but it just worked out perfectly because you know Richard was you know joining our show and I thought a pretty nice like, kind of show warming gift to him would be like you know what guests you want to have on you know the first first week and he's like you know what I have this bromance with Jason Lake man and uh, it'd, be, it'd be like awesome to have, have that, him that on. is actually what I said that's <laughs> true <laughs> bromance <laughs> absolutely so well, I'm uh, thrilled to be here thanks so much for having me and congratulations on 50 episodes um, oh thanks man. that's a lot thanks. of work and uh, a lot of weeks and a lot of guests so congratulations yeah it's gonna be exactly a year and a couple of weeks you know it's just talking to John like 52 will be exactly a year I kind of funny how that works out 52 weeks but so yeah, it's pretty, pretty, pretty awesome. Um, but pretty excited, and uh, uh, you know, you know, you know how shows go too with the executives and and, and all. So it's a uh, it's cool. a lot more work than people realize. You know, everyone's like, oh, you know, they're just doing it from home on a webcam or whatever. The scheduling, the organization, then you got notes, you got background research and coordination, and, and then you get the video stuff. I mean, it's a lot more hassle than it looks like um, when you tune in each week. So, you know, major you props on your room, room and, 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 and get all the stuff that you don't yeah. want people to see in the background. Yeah, I got to throw up all these posters in the back now. Rick, and, Rick yeah, is hiding yeah. Braun. I, I'm hiding Braun. <laughs> <laughs> Dude, GameStop gave me this awesome StarCraft 2 display, this giant StarCraft 2 display that I'm going to have to figure out how to, how to incorporate into the, the background here. But but no, to, to kind of continue the proper introduction of Jason, Jason is, for those of you who don't know, I don't know what few people out there don't know, but he's the uh, founder, owner, CEO of Complexity Gaming, e big esports team, obviously, and... Uh, you know, I've been a huge fan of yours for a long time, and and you know, he's been in esports for actually all three of these guys have been esports for a long time. So I, I think uh, some of the topics we'll go over today, we'll we'll kind of uh, kind of look back at that and just kind of compare it to what's going on nowadays. But all right, let's just jump right into topic number one, guys. So um, Blizzard WCS announcement details and everything. That's obviously the big big news and and uh, talk this week. You know, there Wait, was an announcement. What happened? <laughs> It was announced Tuesday oh. night here. Actually, it was Wednesday, you know, Korea. But um, uh, yeah, so kind of why don't why don't we kind of uh, obviously there's a lot of details. I mean, just to sum it up, uh, you know, Blizzard announced that uh, you know they're kind of upgrading WCS into this this very large tournament league that's gonna try to unify all the turn you know the major tournaments in in uh, StarCraft esports right now and create this single storyline. Uh, I think the prize. I think prize money is 1.6 million dollars, and uh, you know, obviously, a lot more investment going into that. With uh, you know, just the, I, I think the whole thing is broken down into three regions. We're gonna get, we're gonna be. Able, I mean, I got the diagram, everything to show us in a second here, but lots of <laughs> That's details. A and, diagram. Uh, yeah, 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 we're yeah, gonna need it. 
Yeah, yeah. Wow. I mean, here, let me just show it to you now, guys. See, it's right here, okay? So we got this diagram of just kind of how the regions are breaking down. There's going to be three seasons in 2013 with the a, a grand finals culminating at BlizzCon, I believe. And then 2014, I think we'll have four four seasons and same deal, kind of uh, just a huge finals at the end of it. But, um, you know, lots of details we'll talk about it, but I kind of want to get your just high-level general thoughts on the whole thing um, just to start with. Uh, why don't we start with you, Jason? Um, you know, as, as an old timer, I feel very comfortable hanging out with other old timers. Um, <laughs> and John and I, and all of us spoke briefly. My first reaction to this, um, being an old timer and, and just kind of enjoying the study of history and enjoying the study of how things evolve. You know, when I was in law school, I studied a lot of sports law and how the NFL and uh, major league baseball came about. And I found that very intriguing. Um, I find this entire situation that we're currently um, finding ourselves in or enjoying whatever um, to be very interesting back in the old days uh, here's a super basic breakdown on some of the evolution of esports um, there was a couple small leagues generally started by compelling personalities like Angel Munoz who started the um, CPL he then sold the concept to sponsors who gave him a little bit of money to hold video game tournaments um, goes all the way back to you know Quake and Carmack and Ferraris and it's a great story <laughs> should look it up sometime um, but it was basically you know a small group of people or even one person kind of being behind it and then they would have to go to the companies that make the game uh, the game developers and be like hey can we please use your game in our tournament and it was kind of this say hey will you come you know is it okay and kind of you know the coin was completely on the other side back then and then we've kind of evolved to where developers were participating and assisting leagues. Like um, you saw them actually helping with the prize money. You even saw recently um, developers paying some tournament organizers just to get their game on the circuit. They considered it uh, affordable advertising. And now we've kind of gone through that cycle um, during what I kind of call the Wild West of esports, where things were scattered all over. and. For many years, everyone's been asking, who's going to organize this thing? Is it going to be the team union or is it, you know, are all the leagues going to be bought, brought under one umbrella? You know, and the CGS tried to be like, look, we're going to take it over and organize it. And, and no one has obviously succeeded. So now we have the developers who are coming in and kind of calling the shots. Um, you know, League of Legends has their thing. Activision is a million dollar event um, in L.A. this weekend. Um, and now you've got Blizzard finally saying, look this wild west isn't helping anyone this is a little confusing there's content overload um we're gonna step in and if you want to use our game you're gonna you know play ball with us and they've set up this system um which puts them in control so now the game developers in a historical format have taken control and they're basically saying we're going to be the ones to organize this um is this healthy is this sustainable will they disappear when their game kind of stops selling um, I find these questions very interesting, and the entire situation, before we even dive into the nitty-gritty of it, interesting. I will say this, though, on its face. Um, I think it's wonderful that developers are involved in esports. I think it's phenomenal. Mm -hmm. um, for many years, I was ripping my hair out you know, as a business person going, why would you not come in and like make a big deal out of this esports thing? And, you know... Frankly, it is very affordable marketing when you compare it to other forms of marketing, and it grows grassroots user bases that tell all their friends about your game, and it goes viral even before viral was a thing back in the day. Um, so I'm thrilled that Blizzard's doing it. My hat's off to them. Um, as an esports fan and a StarCraft fan, I think it's overdue even. Um, for me personally, as we talked about before the show started, I love StarCraft, but after two years of just non-stop tournaments and daily play hymns <laughs> and it's just like i couldn't even turn on my computer without feeling like i got to turn on something because i'm missing something it was just kind of disorganized and i think for a lot of the fan base it was disjointed and got right. to be a little overwhelming so i think an understandable format run by blizzard itself is a brilliant idea and um i'm super excited that they're doing it so i mean is that what we're getting towards just fewer i mean are you wanting fewer events? Is that what you're you're kind of saying with that statement at the um, end there? I don't know that fewer events is necessarily um, the key. I think 
organization is the key where casual people can come in and look like what is this thing oh okay here's a global tournament yeah. circuit run by the people that make the game that's easy to understand i mean once you get into the details it's a little more convoluted but you understand on its face this is the nfl of starcraft right. i get that it's simple when a casual fan would come into StarCraft before, it's like you got MLG, you got NASL, you got ESL, you got DreamHack, you got GOM, you got G, you know, and then you got Pro League. It's just like, whoa, what in the hell is this? It's very overwhelming. Um, and I don't think that's conducive to building larger fan bases and trying to expand what we're all working on here. Right. Um, so, I mean, of course, there will be issues. And, of course, there's gonna, you know, people that aren't thrilled. But I'm personally happy that Blizzard's taking control of it for the time being and, and good on them. That's my short answer. <laughs> okay, short answer. John, what do you think, man? Uh, I agree with uh, a lot with what Jason said, and I think uh, my worries, I have some genuine concerns. Um, not that I don't think that they can't be worked through, but my general concerns are that we'll get to a point where it becomes a very fragmented um, industry, where esports is not defined as people competing uh, so much in in electronic gaming, it's that they're competing in very specific games. So people, I mean, it, it's it's good that the developers are getting involved. It's very good that they're kind of competing against each other who can offer the better game because that, of course, only helps us as players, as team managers and team owners because we see the benefits of it. Uh, but, you know, I've said this for, for some time. As much as I've bagged on, you know, some things that MLG's done in the past or maybe even ESL or the old school ones like GGL and ESWC is that I believe that we need those. We just need them working together more. And uh, we've they've talked about collaboration, and I'd like to see more of it. You know, and and I, when we had Sundance on the show, you know, he mentioned that there are that they are working on things. It is going to take some time, but I'd much rather go to an event in which there's three or four different games going on than have to choose between the developers um, um, that's just that's just my thoughts on it okay great Richard what do you think um, well it's great that Jason's actually on to answer this because uh, I'm sure his involvement with the CGS and he knows um, CGS were pretty pioneering in what they tried to do even though it didn't quite work out uh, the, the way they wanted uh, it, it to but um, I, I'm kind of on the fence on it to be honest I, I definitely agree with what Jason's saying in that we want developers involved in the game brilliant uh, they control the IP they control the direction of the game if they're involved in esports we get this two way dialogue going on with the people who play it the people that help uh, you know promote it and I think that's a very good thing because you know for example uh, if you look at what Valve have done with their titles, where they've just been completely removed from the esports community, each new kind of update of their games gets further and further away from what the <laughs> pros and what the competitors want. Right. So uh, but their, their involvement within StarCraft, you know, fantastic, and and them finally acknowledging it's a shame it took till 2013, but you know, fair play they got there in the end. Um, but I also think there's a there's a definite risk uh, when a, a developer comes in and says okay we're gonna make this big shiny league with all the prize money and now all the tournaments that exist outside of that you're gonna ha kinda have to dance to the beat of our drum uh, we'll give you ranking points for the events we approve of but if you try and run an event on a conflicting weekend or we just plain don't like you or you know we don't think uh, the way you run the event is conducive to our vision they're gonna get froze out and, and suddenly we're gonna get this kinda tiered uh, you know creation where you're either WCS endorsed or you ain't and, and, and that's not potentially a, a good thing. These monopolies rarely work out. And then as John points out, what happens if one day Blizzard, you know, five years from now is like, okay, well, that was fun. But uh, we got a new game coming out, the new Warcraft's coming out, whatever. We're going we're gonna to transpose all of those resources across to support the newer title. And then when that happens, because the community's been killed off by this big towering behemoth that all seemed nice and shiny at the time... There's nothing to fall back on. There's nothing to go back to. It, it really removes esports from the hands of the community, and it puts it in the hands of businesses. And I, I you know, and I, and think, I, I, it's, I think yeah, that's sorry, it, what you just what you just said is the key. Um, and I've been doing a lot of brainstorming on this since you know the Blizzard's formal announcement. And 
I think that is very much the danger. We want developers involved, absolutely. But at what point is esports going to be set aside um, as an advertisement tool and not as a legitimate sporting activity? Um, that's kind of why this entire phase in esports history, and I do call it a phase because I'm not convinced um, that this is how esports is going to mature and end up. Um, this phase is very interesting for many of us who follow the history of esports because we're not sure exactly how it's going to work out. Like you guys both brought up, there are a lot of downsides to this model. We're thrilled to have their involvement. We're thrilled to have their support. We're thrilled to have their money. But at the end of the day, each game dev only gives a shit about their mm -hmm. own game. Right, that's right. Their mm -hmm. own game. Let's face it. They don't seriously care about esports. They don't seriously care about any ecosystems outside their own game. I mean, it doesn't make them bad people. They work at a company, and their job is to make the company it's money. Okay, so they're viewing esports as a way to sell more copies of their games, to continue the lifespan of their right. games, to sell more expansions or whatever, sell more heroes or whatever it is. And that's fine. That's totally fine. I respect that. But those of us that actually love the concept of esports and building something for the next generation, when they look back and is like, hey, these guys are kind of pioneers. They built this thing that's synonymous as pro soccer or NFL or Major League Baseball from virtually nothing. We look at this, and there's definitely two sides to the coin. Yeah, I mean, but we're we're always going to have that issue with with you know esports because the IP is not. I mean, the IP is not public, right? I mean, and, until there's a game that's actually open source, then we won't have this issue, right? I mean, then then, then there'll be more of a you know it, it it will mirror more like you know regular sports where there are big organizations that you know create their different leagues, and, and there's not just one overseeing thing. So we're gonna have to deal with it for a long time. It's just I, I think it, it'll it'll come to a point. I think the the magic point for esports is when people watch it more than they play it. You know what I mean? Like whenever they don't care so much about the the copies sold versus the money that we're make they're making from advertisement, right? And, and that sort of thing. Just the revenue that's generated there. There. So you know, if they can get to that point, then I think you know, I, I think we could still possibly be in a good you know good place, even with Blizzard like just. You know, having kind of a monopoly, like you're saying, Richard. But, but definitely those. I mean, I think that's the big danger. I think the most people that that kind of, you know, looking between the lines can kind of see. So it's kind of cool that you guys brought that up. The underlying issue. I mean, not really an issue. The thing is, is this is good. It's not yeah, that this yeah. is a bad thing. It's yeah. not that the developers being involved are a bad thing. Um, it's a good thing. I think we just need. I mean, we understand it's a growing pain. I mean, it's definitely something like you're saying. We're, these things are going to happen. People are always going to be looking for an edge, whether it's the developer, or the community, or team managers, or players themselves. They're always going to be looking for how they can get an edge, and this is just one way that developers are doing so. Um, we just, ha I just have some genuine concerns, and, yeah. and we'll kind of wait and see how it plays out. I think in the end. Um, it will work out, but we may yeah. go through a phase in which the developers are taking control and we're like, oh, now hold on just a moment. But I think we'll get to a point where it's kind of in between and it works out for everyone. Yeah, I mean, we've talked about it in the past where I think in an ideal situation, you know, we we don't think developers and esports should be on, honestly intertwined, right? I mean, the, the developer running the esports, right? But you know, I think we can all agree that you know, having an infusion of like a lot of investment, you know, and money into esports is definitely something that we do need in this current state of esports. So, you know, if it has to come from the developer at this point, then I think, you know, for me, it's it's actually yeah. that's kind of a necessary and evil if it is an evil. I, I definitely agree I about the money uh, point, but again, it's the, the trouble is like as Jason pointed out, it's it's not like a charitable donation. You know, when mm -hmm. these companies put money into the game, into the scene, into the community, all of these wonderful terms that make it sound almost altruistic. The reality is they're expecting a return on it. And two things can happen. Either they don't get that return and it stops. And as we've seen in the past, that, that can decimate an entire competitive scene for years, for years to, to, to come yeah. back from that because everyone thinks, well, this is it, we've arrived. People start having unrealistic expectations. People start planning on money that they haven't even earned yet, and it can, you know organizations collapse. I mean, it can be a real bad thing when a when a big developer or any source of income just suddenly decides to pull out because it doesn't see the return. And then the other thing that can happen is it sees the return, 
and it can you know put more in and more in and more in yeah. but again there's always going to be an end game there's always going to mm -hmm. be a point yeah. where more is too much or the return doesn't warrant their involvement in it anymore because what we're doing here is we're making business decisions right, right. so i'm just saying people need to be very careful that you know it, yeah it looks great and we can all you know woo, blizzard are here <laughs> everything's gonna be okay guys but you know the reality is blizzard are a big company and as jason said companies like to make money um when when profit becomes the kind of byword of any project that means all the stuff that we care about as esports enthusiasts that's going to be a secondary or tertiary concern to those guys so i just think you know again we, we need to take everything that happens with, with a grain of salt. If a company gives with one hand, it is invariably looking to take with the other. That's yeah. just the reality of it. Yeah, Jason, you have, you have some comments? I, I tend to look at these things and, and try to look at them optimistically, even though I have a very cynical yeah. nature at heart. Um, if I was Mike Morheim or you know Dustin over at um, Riot, and I looked at the current esports landscape, and I really loved my game, and I really wanted to do it right and develop it properly. I probably would have done the same thing. Yeah. This yeah, has cool. been kind of a rebuilding phase for esports, like Richard said, after the demise of CGS. Um, and it's been a wild west, and people fighting over scraps and one up and ship, and oh, I'm going to release my stats a day after you because then, you know, <laughs> I'll, it's just all this nonsense going on and a lot of infighting and bickering. If I was them, I'd be like, you know what? We'll, we'll play with you guys, but we're going to be the schoolmaster, okay? We're not going to just come on and hope that you kids all get it together because we've given you a couple of years and you haven't. Um, so I think, as an optimist, this phase of esports will actually turn out to be a very positive thing mm -hmm. because the developers are essentially making the leagues and the teams and the organizations around the world play nice. Mm -hmm. They're being like, we're the ones that are really in control here. Um, we're all going to play nice. We're all going to hold hands and sing kumbaya instead of throwing stones across the playground. And even if the developers step back someday, I think the precedent that will be established will be a good one for the growth of esports. Because who better to step in and make everyone quote unquote play nice and work in a cooperative spirit rather than this constant bickering and infighting than the people that control the IPs. Mm -hmm. So as an optimist, I look at this as a chance for someone with the power to unify the sport a little bit, even if it's separate games for now, they're coming in and they're forcing everyone to work together. And as an optimist, I, I hope and I think that's going to you know, turn out to be good. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think I would agree. Yeah, definitely agree with that. All right, let's get into some of the, the details of, of uh, you know, the announcement. And uh, you know, since we talked kind of high level and just kind of what we, what we, what we think of it, um, let's start from the standpoint of the tournament organizers. And again, let me switch over to the... The, the view so we can take a look and um, yeah so the the you know one of the biggest things announced were that there are three regions right NA EU and Korea and for each of the regions there's kind of this um, I don't know well, how would you call it just a representative I guess you know, just an organization that's going to be be um, representing the majors I guess in those those regional finals and that sort of thing in within the regions and uh, for EU it is uh, ESL IEM right. Um, America, it's MLG, and for Korea, it's a partnership between um, between OGN and GOM. Uh, so, what are your thoughts on, I guess, that you know that structure and just the uh, the organizations chosen there? John, you want well, to start? Well, do, do people like oh. regionalization for starters? I'll start. Do people, yeah. do, you know, do, <laughs> like I I don't know how I feel about that like at all. I I, I think uh, in general. Uh, when you kind of and, and look, don't get me wrong. Maybe geographically is the only way to do it, but I know it just feels a bit isolationist, and I, and I don't think it's very good for the kind of promotion of talent pools either, particularly like uh, in terms of developing the game, because we all know where the talent is, and if you start segregating people in the professional leagues, and you know people don't get to kind of cross over and play until the very finals, you, you again you're going to create tiers of talent where the people that make it through are likely to be the same people that make it through again and again and again because they're the people that are getting to play uh, the better players from the better regions well, this segment is, consistently. Well, this segment is not so much about the players as much as just the, or, you know, the tournament organizers. Now, we'll get to the players, believe me. I, got, I definitely have some comments on that. But just you know, choosing, I guess, only these partners to be, like, I guess, above other organizations. So, for instance, let's just bring up EU, right? Like, 
So IEM being chosen. I think a lot of people were surprised that IEM was chosen over DreamHack, given that the DreamHack events, you know, went so well last year. Um, yeah. You know, so talk to me about y'all's opinions on just that. You know, just well, I'm not surprised by that at all, actually. That that there's that there's I guess you know that, that there's some ESL was chosen over DreamHack because oh, I'm, DreamHack's... Not, I'm, not, I'm not I'm not saying so much that you know if it was chosen. I'm just kind of asking just generally, like, do you think it's a good idea to to choose I guess these kind of organizations to be above the others um, in regards to the WCS? No, I don't think it, it's it's good. That that's my fear. That's my concern is that they, as we talked about before, they start picking and choosing. And then everyone else kind of gets left behind, and they're. It's no. It's a, not wrong to be second tier because I believe in a tiered system. But this is not setting that up to be a tiered system. They're just basically picking and choosing event organizers, and how they did that, we're not quite sure, obviously. But they're picking and choosing event organizers to represent their brand, and everyone else is kind of left with mm -hmm. what, with really no support. Jason, what do you think? Um, I, I see his concern basically. Um, he's his concern base is based around the developers becoming kingmakers, basically, where they get to pick and choose what esports leagues are tier one, tier two, tier three, and quite possibly what esports leagues um, live and die. Um, I have very mixed feelings on the way it's set up, but um, I think it just was a matter of um, practically speaking, they had to start somewhere type of thing mm -hmm. um, they could have been much more strict and said look these are the leagues that's it period you are not allowed to play starcraft anywhere but our league right take it to the extreme to the extreme um, they even gave a happier middle ground to um, the dream hacks or nasls and other leagues saying we'll give you qualifier points which draws our fans into your event is it perfect no um, but be i've been mm -hmm. involved with the creation of a global type of league before and there is no such thing as perfect. There comes <laughs> a point not. when you just have to say, this is what it is. Mm -hmm. It's not perfect. We're going to continue to try to improve it. Um, let's get this product out there. Maybe it's a beta phase. Um, but I, you know, whether they went with this league or that league or whatever, um, everyone's going to have differing opinions. I think they're just doing their best and they wanted to get something off the ground. So Yeah, I mean, it's just interesting because obviously Korea has two. Right, I mean, there it's more of a partnership between the two, right? And, and the other two only have one, so it's just kind of like I just wasn't sure why they decided on one with the others when you know Korea already set the precedent of having two. And obviously, those two two organizations are have different kind of segments within you know the Korean esports over there or StarCraft Two, but still, you know, I just wasn't sure why they decided on that. Um, well, what do people think about the actual choice of ESL over DreamHack? Anyway, I mean. Well, John, you said you weren't surprised. No, I'm not surprised side. at all. I mean, here's what they did. Blizzard had to have reached out to both of them. They had to have. Um, I would think so. I would hope so. Um, and they're they're posting some tweets by Robert Olin in the chat, which are interesting, uh, to say the <laughs> least. But I'm sure that they reached out to both of them. Or as soon as ESL and DreamHack got wind of it, I would hope that they would have reached out to Blizzard right away and said, hey, we can facilitate this. We can run this. But because there's an online presence to this, there's an online element of it, ESL just makes a lot more sense. Uh, they have bigger numbers, they have a user base, they have a database of, of, of online users that can play, they have a bracket system, a league system, whatever it may be. So, and the um, studio too. Enjoy. Yeah, yeah. It, just made, it just made sense uh, to me. Um, would, I, would DreamHack would have been a good choice as well? Of course. But uh, I think for, logistically for what Blizzard wants to do, which uh, again, I, I think the overall what they're trying to do is really good um, we'll just have to wait and see how it all works out but I think ESL was a good choice yeah I was hoping Robert could pop in here for a second but I think Robert uh, is like really busy because his kids are, are sick but um, yeah I spoke with him a little bit and he's got some interesting thoughts on it I probably won't mention them here now but um, uh, yeah it, it, that's that's definitely one of the things concerning that with I, I think just you know just the choice you know DreamHack versus I am because Whatever little bits that I heard beforehand is that I heard that DreamHack, I, I was under the impression that DreamHack was going to be the, uh, you know, the EU rep basically there, but um, yeah. then you know obviously <laughs> not. So um, okay, so let's get into the players a little bit and like kind of like what this means for the players and just the whole, 
you know, regionalization of it all. And, um, you know, the biggest thing is that the players have to choose which region to play in. Um, and once they choose, then they have to play in it for the duration of, you know, that year, you know, I guess that, you know, those three seasons. But I heard on 2013 that they can, they can choose to switch after the first season. Um, from another from a player, so I'm not sure if that's completely true or not. But that's kind of that's what I've heard from a player. So, um, you know, uh, what do you guys think of that? Just having to choose what region you want to play in, and oh, I mean, getting to choose what region you want to play in. Whether you know you you want to you know you're in Korea and you want to play in NA or vice versa, and um, and you know just so having can to, you to still do... live in Korea and yeah, choose to play in, in NA? Well, yeah. there's that's something yep. fundamentally wrong with that. It's not really regionalizing anything if you can just choose. Yeah, it's it's it, yeah. That's my biggest thing. It's like I don't know. They shouldn't call it regionalization because it's really just server, you know, it's yeah. server allocation. I mean, just which server you choose more so than yeah. region. Now, if you're a Korean living in the United States or in in Europe, and that's what you choose to be a region because you live there, but your race. This is what I've talked about long ago. We need to get away from the whole race thing, but. And I'm talking human race issues, but if a Korean, let's say, you know, wants to human live in the United States, in Texas, let's say, you know, otherwise known as maybe Violet or, or, Polt. or Atlanta or Polt, and that's what they oh. choose as the region because regionally that's where they live, uh, that should be their choice. It doesn't matter what their race is. No, I mean, well, I, I, I thought region should be done regionally. Yeah. Well, yeah. You know, I mean, I don't know, maybe I'm old-fashioned, right? Like, uh, maybe I missed a meeting, but yeah, but yeah. You know, that, that's what I that's what I think. And when I was reading, I, I was reading a interview uh, with with Mike before um, I came on at the show as part of research. Um, I was I was I was looking at what he said, and when he yeah, that is absolutely right. You can live anywhere and enter any other element, of, you know, of the region of the league. Like it's it's ridiculous. I mean, there's got to be there has to be some sort of if you're going to do it, and I'm not saying I would do it that way, I would try and divide it up by talent, I guess, if I was doing it in my head. But anyway, ignore what's happening in my head. Like just divide it by talent? What do you, what do you mean? I, I try and seed it so each division had the same amount of people in it rather that, that were all... You're zoning it? <laughs> yeah, kind Oh my kind. goodness. I try and okay. do it like that. And why would I try and do it like that? Because you can't have one region that's going to have all the super fiends that are all great at the game and then another region that's going to be weak and then the top six from that region or whatever right. is going to play the top six from that region get battered but because of the experience they gained from that they're going to be a little this... bit better so they're going to win their region over and over what's, and over what's again. What's the World and Cup? You, you I mean, futuristic like... monopoly is what you're doing, effectively. A talent monopoly. It seems oh, my insane. gosh. Oh, man. Okay. Look, okay I, I, I'm, talking about, I'm talking about the problems that are going to crop up two years down the road, right? Okay. But, yeah, d just there has to be some strict policy, and I'm sure they'll introduce one. I'm sure you said it's a work in progress. This kind of revised thing. I'm sure the first thing that's going to come out of this is actually allowing anyone to enter any region they want, regardless of where they live who they are is, is that, yeah. absurd yeah well, who would have thought that i d well i mean i think that, i, I honestly i think i think it has a lot to do with logistics i mean you know like it, it's one thing to have the wcs last yeah. year where it's like you're representing your country you know like obviously there it's a lot easier to prove that with citizenship and that sort of thing but when you're talking about just region i mean how are they going to enforce that i mean you know even making you live there for a year is it's not easy to like it's not easy to do you know, just with visas and everything, right? So, it, I, I think from a logistics standpoint, it's, it, it's kind of a nightmare just doing that versus yeah. <clears throat> countries. I, I'm guessing here, but I think you hit the nail on the head. I think this is going to be for 2013. We're already three months into the year. I think they're like, well, what if a Korean player would much rather play in North America um, than Korea? But the rule is you have to be like a, re a resident for three months or, or whatever, to participate in that region so somebody at a meeting probably said well why don't we just open it up this year but the logical next step would be towards the end of this year they're going to announce look in 2014 if you want to play in a certain region you have to live there yeah. because they're going to continue to regionalize it i'm totally speculating but i think mm -hmm. that would that would make sense because you guys are right that it strips the entire region concept if you can just play from seoul or paris and Play whatever hell region you want like you said it comes down to servers then and that doesn't really fulfill the logical thing that you've just gone ahead and built so mm -hmm. my guess is it's just going to be for this year 
Yeah, and you know this this whole re- like if it you know regionalization talking about re- regionalization, I actually think it's a great thing. But you know again like what what they've implemented this season, I don't think is is good just because it's only server. But I think regionalization in general is good, and that's why I was super excited about this news. You know like um, before it came, you know before the details more of the details came out uh, because. You know, we need some regionalization here in NA, yes. in, in the U.S. The re- I want to jump in here. The regionalization concept is an interesting one. It can be debated ad nauseum. Um, mm-hmm. Some of the deep underlying roots are you got two camps um, for competitive anything, but particularly esports because of the Internet revolution. Um, you got one that says, look, the region is planet Earth. We've got the internet. I can play a kid uh, on Quake who's living in Brazil or whatever. Those boundaries are gone. They're artificial. We're all going to rise above that crap. Um, This is the new internet generation. There should be no regions. Esport is a global sport. Great argument. Um, The other side comes from a more traditional psychological um, point of view. Here's what they're saying. Like it or hate it. Mankind has kind of have this innate us versus them mentality. Okay, when you're watching Americans play, for example, and then the American champion is going to go play the champion of the European theater or whatever, that is drama. It creates this us versus them in the sport that already kind of exists in people naturally like it or, or hate it. And sports psychologists over the years have played on this us versus them mentality um, that goes way back in human psyche to, to create a more compelling um, product basically it's not as pretty but that's kind of the ugly truth what is regionalism if it's not the us versus them otherwise you do what I said prior and just open up to the world the whole concept of regionals let's find out who's best amongst us and then we'll go play them and that is obviously the very basic mm-hmm. way to explain it but that's exactly what it boils yeah, down that's to. The f- I mean that's <laughs> That's what all the sports are built on. The regionalization, the regionals, the regionals or the regions just happen to be like cities, or they happen to be countries, right? Or they happen to be, you know, however you want to break it down. But yeah, us versus them is is like the fundamental of like like I think what sports is built on in a lot of ways right now. Um, may, maybe there's some exceptions like I don't know, even golf and tennis. I mean, I, there's still a little bit of that. Um, but uh, but yeah, so I I think. I don't know. I just think that it, it's it's a. Uh... Does it apply to StarCraft though? I mean, like mm-hmm. I know people from America who they, they cheer on Koreans. Their favorite player players are Koreans. Uh, Europeans as well. Everyone's got their own favorite. It's like it's such well, an individual and personalized sport. Like, does nationality really come into it all that much? It does. Uh, they call does. foreigners their own country. Yeah, I mean, like again, that's just something. It, it's gotten to that point, we yeah. But, well, it's gotten to that point. We okay, let's. Yeah. I mean, let's talk about that. I mean, yeah, I mean, right now it's like foreigners is such a wide thing because it's there's it's just so few. There's just not very many of them represented in in a lot of these big tournaments, right? And we've had to kind of take an aggregate of foreigners versus just like Americans or or Canadians or Germans and that sort of thing. Um, <laughs> it's, it's the truth. It's just a pure numbers thing. And and you're crazy if you don't think that that you know some Americans would not cheer for an American like contender much harder than a, a, a Korean, even Flash. You know I, d- I, mean? I don't know. I, like, I, think, no I think people do it based on personality, or they do it based on who's the underdog more than what country they're from. You know, and obviously you can argue that if you're not from Korea, you're automatically an underdog, right? I get that, but what, what, eventually one day that's going to change, <laughs> yeah? Okay? So what, so what I'm saying is I, I think people, I know, like, I, I cheer on great players. That's that's how I look at it, and I, I don't really yeah. care if they happen to be Korean, European, or American. I, I'd like to think I'm maybe representative, but maybe I'm not. Maybe I'm being ignorant. Maybe there are like this hardcore like nationalistic fans who are like, it doesn't matter who it is, it could be my favorite Korean player of all time. Mm-hmm. If he's playing someone who's got the same flag as me, I'm going for that dude every time. Like, maybe. Yeah, and I, and I, I tend to side with you. I prefer yeah. the global thing where maybe my favorite Counter-Strike, Counter-Strike team is Brazilian. Maybe my favorite StarCraft player is Korean. Maybe my favorite Quake player is um, from the Ukraine. I mean, that's how I follow esports. That's how I mm-hmm. think it should be. But or by team. You know, oh you yeah. Know, yeah. I follow absolutely. complexity players over. I want to see him just absolutely hammer EG players yeah. every time, right? 
Yeah, I mean, so, I, so I guess it's not true. I'm just using yeah. it as an example. And so it doesn't matter their race, which is why I've said before, this whole yeah. race thing has gotten out of control. No, it's it, in a sense. I mean, you know, part part of my like, you know, obviously opinion I'm talking about right now for me is is I mean, it's a little bit construed because I'm thinking over the standpoint of just growth for esports too. So, you know, yeah, a lot. Of, I mean, I love watching the Koreans play StarCraft too. I mean, I love watching the highest level of StarCraft too. So I, I'm like one of those hardcores that that you know doesn't really see it that way too. But I cheer hard, hard for the foreigners because you know it's, it might be a little bit to do with the underdog thing, Richard. But for me, it's just like it's just about growing esports and like, you know, there's so much potential in you know here. In NA, I mean that that we haven't even tapped into. I mean, I'm talking about just like like tripling, quadrupling, five xing, ten xing the the industry now that we haven't even gotten, we haven't even touched at all. You know what I mean? And I and it's sad because I I, ha I think that I, I have to like point to like things like this, like regionalization, as a way to grow that. You know what I mean? Because that's you know you talked about one day, Richard, that's going to get to that. Well, what day is that going to be if we don't help it out? Yeah, okay, but I mean, I'm just saying like, right? how I mean, we coax it along and how we help it. We got to think about that because look, do we? Everyone in esports is trying to copy the mainstream sports model, yeah. But any mainstream sports fan knows there's a lot in mainstream sports that actually sucks that we would want to totally get rid of if you could rebuild sports from the ground up tomorrow. There's a lot, and I think part <laughs> yeah. of it is that jingoistic, nationalistic. Um, you know, the, the, the flag conquers all, it doesn't matter about anything else kind of attitude that you get in, you know, I'll say soccer because there's an American audience watching <laughs> soccer audiences, uh, you know. Uh, <laughs> there's a lot of EUers watching, dude. <laughs> uh, yeah, okay, okay, so, so, right, okay, soccer, football, whatever. But, you know, like, and, and, and I, I wouldn't want that to necessarily creep into eSports. I've already seen it. I've seen it from a Counter-Strike background where you know pe people in eastern europe and the ukraine and poland places like that get very patriotic about their team's fortunes and it's not always a pleasant thing and it, it leads to a lot of uh, obfuscation of the facts and 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 people um you know they're not being very fair and another thing i think that might be worth mentioning at this juncture was what was the incident recently where like flash got booed and everyone was saying yep. what a disgrace MLG. it was MLG. now if, if yeah. right, so if we if we start pushing this regional kind of ideal, and and as Jason exactly you know surmises, you know the 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 them and us culture, the them and us concept, aren't we going to see more scenes like that? And 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 you know I know that's a divisive issue in itself. Do we want more scenes like that? John, do we want, John, do we want more scenes like that? Do we want more uh, regional scenes? Do we want more like you know people getting Booing. booed? Yes. That's right. I knew he was going to say that. <laughs> I say that yeah. I, I, Fan <laughs> is short for fanatic. And we need more yep. fanatics, especially in StarCraft 2, for crying out loud. If you got, if, if StarCraft 2 players should be fans and players and people that know esports only based on StarCraft 2, should spend about 20 minutes watching Counter Strike videos of teams. <laughs> you sure they want you to watch that? <laughs> no. <everybody. laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> they should. That's. I mean, we need more of that, and and we do we do need more, you know, people rooting for players because of the team they're up there on, because of the the region that they're in. You know, I if 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 I put together a Nebraska team for the CSL, right, and I, you know, maybe some of my some of the players that I like also play for the Texas team, but I'm going to root for uh, my Nebraska team to to win it. Um, because I, I feel something for that, you know. Especially, and somebody keeps mentioning this in the chat, and I'm not quite sure exactly who it is, but it brings up a good point um, that, especially for amateur, casual, or new viewers to a game, uh, they need something more to attach themselves to because they may not have a high level of understanding of the game itself to be able to say, well, a match between uh, Flash and so on, you know, and, and so and so is like an amazing match for them. It does, that doesn't correlate for them. That do, they don't understand that part. But they do understand that their buddy down the street is playing in a match versus whoever because they don't care who the other person is and they want to root for that person because they have more of a connection to that person and they understand the game better from that aspect as opposed to whether they understand you know, um, the ins and outs of the actual game itself. Because again, and people know this have watched the show before, I watch a lot of StarCraft. I don't I still don't have enough time to even understand, uh, to have a clue of what 
what's really going on. But because of my involvement in the whole Violet thing in the past with CSN, I rooted for him every time, and I followed Team Liquid, Liquidpedia, right. every time that he was playing. I wanted to know how he was doing because I had a personal connection to him, right. um, and I wanted to see him do well. And if someone said, "Oh man, if you liked that match between Violet and the Muslim, you should check out the match between you know Axlov and Desra," I'm like, "Yeah, if I check that out, I'm not really going to have a clue because I don't really understand the game enough to, to know whether or not that's a great match compared to what Violet just played in. But I certainly do um, respect Violet and follow him and want to know how he's doing. All right, well, I think that's, uh, I think, what, 40 minutes on a topic is pretty good. So and since we have Jason on here, we should definitely uh, get to talking about some complexity, complexity uh, news and what you guys are up to. Uh, so let's transition over to, um, yeah, just kind of what you guys are working on and you know, I was glancing at the you know website the other night, and just kind of looking at just all the game, you know, all the teams that you have now, and just all the games that you cover. Um, I figured it'd be good to talk a little bit about just uh, your thoughts on you know diversification, game diversification, and and uh, you know just get trying to get a team like out there in as many games as you as possible, and kind of the benefits that of that for a team. Um, yeah, absolutely. Uh, this fall will be our 10th uh, anniversary. Ten years ago, wow. I fired up the Complexity brand um, as a Counter-Strike team. And at the time, my only intention was to have a Counter-Strike team. Um, somewhere along the lines, I can't even recall why, um, you know, we picked up a second game. And it was around that time after I picked it up, I started really looking at this as a business and inspe you know investing real stuff sums of money into it as a business um and early on i came to the conclusion which not everyone shares but um i'm still pretty confident in it that for a team-based organization like mine to really thrive and exist and properly represent sponsors over a period of time um you want diversification um games are constantly changing audiences are constantly changing um if we'd done this show Oh, five, six years ago, um, probably ninety-eight percent of your audience would have known exactly who I am, who I was. Um, <laughs> today, an entirely new generation of gamers has grown up because they were, you know, six years old back during the Counter Strike glory days, and you know, a lot of them will come on and be like, "Why is that dude wearing a red tie? Like, who the heck is this guy?" and the demographic changes at such a speed, the games and the technology all change at such a speed where, in my opinion, the only way to remain a viable business in what we do at Complexity is to have diversification. Um, if we sunk all our eggs in the 1.6 basket, um, we would be out of business today because the game is gone. Um, even with the title as mighty as StarCraft, it's my personal opinion if you sink all your eggs in that basket i mean at some point in time god forbid there may come a day um when starcraft doesn't run a big enough audience to viably market your sponsor's products to and then um you know you're quickly out of the door from there mm -hmm. so i'm a big believer in diversification not only from the business side though but um i love games I'm always trying different <laughs> games. I love video games, and it's just a hell of a lot more interesting to me to associate with different gamers, to manage different gamers, to, to have different games under the complexity flag that we can cheer for and, and, and work with, and you know, variety is a spice of life to some extent, I think. So that's why I believe in diversification. So what, what games right now are, do, you th do you feel like are the focal points? Well, I mean, obviously, you got League of Legends, um, StarCraft. Um, Dota is a strong game. Heroes of New Earth. Um, on the FPS side, it's less clear. Call of Duty um, is slowly climbing up this ladder of esports maturity and um, building real fan bases. Uh, we had an episode on the executives talk a little bit about mm -hmm. um, where Call of Duty's at with Hasbro. Um, I'm going down the million dollar event this weekend. I'm not a giant fan of huge million dollar events and then developers disappearing for the rest of the year, but it's my mm -hmm. hope that Activision won't do that. Um, moving no, on they'll to the release another game in about four months, so you'll see them around. 
<laughs> that's the Call of Duty one, right? Yeah. But um, they're working with MLG, and I see some good things there. I mean, obviously, you've got where my heart started and still is, the Counter-Strike franchise, um, which is trying to um, climb the ladder, pardon the pun, <laughs> back to its uh, days of glory. And I'm getting tweeted, like, ask him about Counter-Strike, because, you know, that's that's where I came from. Those are my roots. Um, my son sits over on this laptop over here every single day playing Counter-Strike Go!, um, and I really hope the community can get there. Uh, for an organization like mine to invest in a top-tier team um, can cost $200,000 a year in sal- salary and travel and maintenance and other things. And when you want to go into a game like that, you can't just think emotionally, or I would have been on CSGO the date they uh, you know, popped that thing on the Internet. Um, We'd love to be back in Counter-Strike. Uh, we just haven't found the right group, and we're not yet convinced um, that it's going to go anywhere. As Richard alluded to, Valve doesn't have the best history for supporting their titles. And in this day and age, games that don't have developer support, um, for better or worse, are going to have a tough time making it as an eSport. That's just the reality where we it are. It to go free to um, play as well, I think. Uh, but that's, uh, that's a whole different show right there. I mean, what about Dota 2? I mean, Dota 2, is all, I mean, are they... I mean, a lot of people yeah, have been talking about <clears throat> about just you know Valve and Dota two recently. Yeah, I mean Valve has definitely um, been making a lot. Get out. It, oh, your mic's cutting out, Jason. Cutting out. Uh, you hear me now? Might be better. Yeah. Yeah, there we go. Yeah. That's um, the international. Oh, uh, it's that's going out again. Uh, you hear me? Yeah, now I can hear you. Okay. Um, but, uh, yeah, I was saying the, what Valve did with the International and some of the things they did, like, with the you know the team things you could buy and share the revenue with the teams were revolutionary, and I think it was fantastic. Mm-hmm. So I just hope they would take some of that and move it over to Counter-Strike. So, But we'll see. Don't get me on a Counter-Strike rant, or we'll, we'll be here a very <laughs> long time. You, you, were, I mean, uh, you were late to the party with League of Legends, though, right? I mean, yeah, you and we, a lot of the American organizations came to it pretty late, which I was surprised about. We had a team previously, um, and unfortunately, they just internally disintegrated. And as we saw how big the league was getting, it's just, I keep, I call, every time I talk about it, I call it a juggernaut, because that's what it is statistically in the world of esports. We knew we wanted to get back in, but there weren't a lot of options. You know, people had planted their flags. You've got Solomids and CLGs and Kirk and these wonderful... <laughs> And there weren't a lot of options out there. Uh, then with the announcement of the LCS, we knew immediately we had to be in the LCS, but we weren't sure exactly how. So it's been a long road to get to where we are. Um, we've got some great guys. Um, they're not doing well to, you know, win, win loss wise, but we just made a change actually this week. And people that know uh, me and my partner Jason Bass were just as happy. Um, getting a squad of guys working with that squad, maybe tinkering with it, maybe changing a player or two and building our own team and building it to greatness than just hiring whoever is hottest on the block at that moment. So uh, Yeah, but it, it's essential for a gaming organization to be in LCS right now, isn't it? Mm. <laughs> Jason, what yeah. happens? I have a c- question, actually. Oh, what happens? Because um, I like what you're saying about you know wanting to build a team as, to po- I mean, uh, as opposed to create a team or buy a team. Uh, what happens, though, if you guys are removed from the LCS after their mid-season reorganization stuff? Well, I mean, what happens with the team? I mean, I... That's why it took us so big a team after we found out of LCS, because if you're investing all this money, and we spend thousands of dollars each month, even, you know, in addition to what um, Riot's doing, which is very generous for the players and travel and everything, we're still investing a good amount of money in League of Legends. Um, so if you're investing that money and got a five-man team and then they don't, you know, the, the top four stay in basically. The bottom four from North America got to battle it out with the contenders who all want their spots at the big dance, right? So if we go into that, which we're going to, we're, we're going to, and then we're out, I mean, it's terrible. You've invested all this money. Now you're not even at the dance anymore. So but, like I've yeah, seen a million times. Not to bring this up because we've talked about it before, but I, it's absolutely mo- one of the most ridiculous formats I've ever known <laughs> or seen. But because that's exactly what you're talking about, then you're like stuck. Um, was I'm just 
real quick curious because I don't want to stay on this too long, but was there a conversation with them about that format, about the fact that, hey, we're still going to be putting money into this, and then you're telling us that halfway through the real season, we could just possibly be gone and out and our guys uprooted and have to move back home? Or was there any conversation with them about that? My knowledge, none of the traditional larger team-based organizations um, were consulted to any serious level. Okay. Um, and I could absolutely be wrong. I say that because after the details of LCS came out, um, several of us kind of got together in the old boys' room and smoked cigars. You know, it's a joke. <laughs> <laughs> I like what he just says. It's just the old boys' room. Here it is. You just been confirmed. Uh, so tweet that. Yeah, exactly. I love it. All right. Good. Sorry. Not, sorry. With the other teams in the league, where we had a lot of issues with things, being like, "Hey, we really want to be a part of this. What you're doing is great, but if you want, you know, so on and so forth." So. They very well could have. Don't quote me. Perhaps they consulted with, with the others and just not me. Um, I'm not saying I hate it or love it, but um, as far as I know, a lot of teams weren't consulted. Okay. Okay. Just just was wondering because I, we had talked about this in the past and 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 didn't hear anything about it. But okay. Yeah. So you know, given that you do like to build a team, you know, with that type of format, I mean, how. You know how is that possible? Because you know you see teams that are. I feel well. There's there's a kind of sense of desperation. You know, trying to get into LCS, right? And for some of the teams, and that's why some of the teams, you know, they they literally, you know, will pick up a team and then they'll drop and then pick up another team type of type of uh, type of thing. So, I mean, how hard is it for you guys to have to? I mean, it's it's even more bigger of a risk for you guys if you're gonna take yeah, the and, approach that you do. I've said this a hundred times. Management on any level in any company in any business um but especially in my opinion in, in something as turbulent as esports is much more an art form than a science <laughs> um you know if that way you just pick five guys and you spend a lot of kind of um stirring them together building a team, which is basically what i did with counter-strike way back in the old days um you got a new reality right? you got companies paying you good money each month to have championship competitive gamers competing at big events like those. Yes. So you got to get in there. You really don't have the time to start from the ground floor. So you always try to get the best possible scenario you can get within your budget and where you think you can get a return on investment. Mm -hmm. It's a little bit different each time. Sometimes you hit a home run and you look like you're a genius, and other times you completely fall flat on your face and you look like an idiot. And that's just kind of the nature of the beast when it comes to team-based organizations. Okay, great. Um, in regards to StarCraft, you know, you know, obviously there was the news of you know you guys moving, just closing down the house, like um, you know, late in 2012, huh? and you know, then you you picked up the FCC. Um, you know, since then there hasn't been much news, you know, coming from StarCraft Two team. So, is StarCraft a huge priority for you guys right now, or, I mean, yeah, like, I mean, not only not only do we love the game. Um, as owners and managers, we still play it. Um, you know, it's obviously just mathematically speaking a game that you need to have some presence in if you do what we do for a living. Um, our big thing was we'd had a lot of ups and downs. I'll just I'll be straight with you. The complexity as a brand, we got into StarCraft late because none of us thought it was going to be big in the West. Um, we completely were wrong, obviously. One of the biggest mistakes we've made in, in, in the last five, six years. So we've been playing catch-up ever since. We've had some amazing players. We brought on Root, and we had great times with them. We brought in several great Korean players. I mean, think about it. We had Nanawa on our team. We had Stefano sign for that controversy. <laughs> I mean, Wait, like, how, long, how long? How long did you have him sign? Uh, like 24 hours or so <laughs> before. I think it was 12 hours before it blew up. So we had, right. I mean, Stefano. We were... 99% the way there with Thorzane, before many people knew Thorzane. Um, we have worked hard and we have scouted well, and it just seems every time we turn the corner, we, between our our own mistakes and just pure bad luck in odd situations like people not wanting to honor contracts and other things, it's been a bumpy road for us, but we still love the game. Um, so with Heart of the Swarm coming out, we're like, look, We've got some great guys in our team. You know, they might not be huge superstars. They might not get invited to all the podcasts or whatever. Let's keep what we've got and let's see how this heart of the swarm thing pans out. Let the game come out. 
let's see how people are playing. You know, there's bound to be new stars that arise, and we want to find them early and bring them on. We'll have the next Thorzy and Stefano. Obviously, some of the people from Wings of Liberty, many may, maybe, are going to be great at this game because that's what they do all day. But I would bound to bet you there's going to be some people that are a little lesser known that are going to come and be standing on the big stage. So right now we're still a little bit in wait mode. We've had, what, one big Heart of the Swarm tournament? Con- or is it one? The MLG? Two, um, really. You know, we- I, I am in MLG. I guess I am. Yeah, I am. Mm-hmm. the first. What? That's right. Um, you know, so we're, we're definitely going to be coming back a little heavier in StarCraft, but right now mm-hmm. we're kind of in a wait-and-see mode, and Maybe a little gunshot, to be honest with you, because both Jason Bass and I feel like we're almost kind of cursed in this game. Like, um, <laughs> oh, no. we, try, we try out and we've had great people on our team, but it's just like, you know, sometimes you try to climb the hill and you keep falling flat on your face and you're just like, let's stop and catch our breath a minute. And mm-hmm. I think that's kind of where we're but we'll definitely be back for StarCraft. Okay, that's great to hear. Great to hear. And. You're coming about podcasts. I mean, Kevin's on all the podcasts, so I don't know what you mean by that. So. Kevin, uh, unbelievably intelligent about the intricacies of the game, but you know, there are just some people in StarCraft, like with anything, where people pick who they like, and they're popular, and that's just the way it's mm-hmm. going to be. And they're on six podcasts a week, and every dang time you turn on Twitch, you see their face, and that that's great. These people have worked hard and put in their time, mm-hmm. and. And, um, that's the way it is, but I'm I'm personally kind of hoping for some fresh blood to liven up the mix in Heart of the Swarm. Uh, agreed. Yeah, that would be nice. That'd definitely be nice. Uh, let's see. Next thing I want to talk to you about has more more to do with sponsorship. And um, mm-hmm. you know, I, I was I was talking to Jason, you, you know, your partner Jason Bass, and and you know, I was hanging out with he and his wife like in, at CES earlier this year. And um, he mentioned just how how great the whole ro- royalty model is for you guys when it comes to sponsorship. In fact, I think I think you're the only team that I know of that really utilizes it to, you know, like to a great extent. So I was wondering if you, you know, you could talk a little bit about that or not. <laughs> uh, no, absolutely. Um, it's a very, you know, you're almost like uh, reaching in my Easter egg basket here, Chris, but uh, I've spoken you don't say about anything. it a You don't have to say anything you don't want. Yeah, it's all good. You know, I'm a big believer in helping other people kind of learn different ways to bring revenue, even if they're competition to complexity. Um, that's why I do the. That's why I've done I think 26 episodes mm-hmm. on the executives. Which is um, awesome. We've got to build it together and and stop being so cutthroat and try to help each other. Um, our our relationship with Sound Blaster, which is by far and away our biggest and now our longest um, relationship, is kind of based in a revenue um, royalty model. Obviously, I can't go into all the details. Uh, the basics are we get a small amount of cash um, to kind of help fund operations, and the rest is built off a royalty model. For those that don't know what a royalty is, if you go into a Best Buy or, or whatever, and you'll see a complexity logo on, on their headsets. Um, so each time they sell a headset, um, they give us a little bit of the money they made from that headset. This is beneficial in a couple ways because it enables a company to come in without a huge chunk of change sitting there that's just fixed. Mm-hmm. Now we become partners, basically. The better we market your product, the better more products you're going to sell and the more money we're going to make. It's the true quintessential partnership versus, hey, can you pay me five or $10,000 a month? Um, oh, your sales are down? You owe me ten thousand. Too bad. Oh, your sales have tripled. <laughs> oh, damn. I guess you just owe me ten thousand. It creates, in in our belief, a, a long term where we're all in this together. Mm-hmm. Like we go and consult on their products. We see these demos while they're doing it, and we'll our players and we will test them and be like, look, we'll be honest with you, this sucks. Don't do it like this. This doesn't work right. Or it doesn't feel comfortable or whatever. So we're fully vested in making sure their products are gonna be the best products they can be for gamers. And if they have a really bad quarter and we're not doing good and we're not moving their products to the best of our abilities, um, or if the complexity logo on that box just becomes meaningless because we don't have enough fans or people don't want to support esports, they don't give a damn, um, then none of us are making money. So it's yeah. sink or swim together, and that's kind of the basics of it. And um, it's been successful on many levels, and we work with them on different things around the world. From We just throw a huge t- – um, here's a newer tournament for them. Um, so it's marketing on many levels based around a royalty agreement. Kind of uh, not unique in the real, 
but I think it's fairly unique um, in the esports world. You yeah. uh, have you ever had any embarrassing moments where like players have been I don't know photographed using rival headsets or anything like that? <laughs> I gosh, I'm gonna throw something across the room. If I had a dollar for every time I there, <laughs> some guy turns on his turns on his uh, camera and he's got his old razor head on because he broke his sound blaster in a fit of rage an hour earlier and I'm just calling these people up like come on it's a whole other conversation about game <laughs> <laughs> that helped make me a little crazy it's, but yeah that happens on occasion absolutely hey uh, you, you said something and people might have just skimmed over but People don't realize you still have a Heroes of Neuroth team. Uh, <laughs> you may be the only large team that has one. And I completely support that because oddly enough, people don't realize it, but uh, there's a lot of good tournaments for that game and that pay. And why not have a team if you're going to keep winning every every event, huh? I mean, some people you know, that are cynical kind of consider it the red-headed step and um, League of Legends, but the statistics and the viewer and the fan base is is significant. And um, you know, we have a top, conservatively, I'd say a top three team in the world, probably top two on any given day. Um, and they do a good job and draw in huge streamer numbers. And it doesn't get a lot of attention, like from the StarCraft scene or other scenes. But that's back to diversification. We could be, you know, we're top probably. Well, we'll find out this weekend, but we're top five in the world at COD. We're top two probably in the world at Heroes of New Earth. To these communities, even though the StarCraft community that watches your show might be like, so what? To these <laughs> communities, big deal. Yeah. And that enables us to effectively market to them and to drive you know, their eyeballs to our sponsor social media and their partner social media. And when you add up different games together, not only does it provide you longevity, but it provides you with a bigger next egg to market for your partner than if you're saying just one game and that's your sole reliance. Right, right. Makes sense. So we recently, um, you you guys pulled on Newegg for a sponsor, which is congrats on that. Um, and that was mostly Jason Bass, by the way. Oh, was it? Uh, okay. <laughs> Good job, pulled, Jason. Honestly, for years. This has been an ongoing, hey, yeah, that sounds good for like probably three and a half, four years. So, um, it was very, very um, enjoyable to finally get that one done, and, and they have some great people over at Newegg who are super excited to work with them. Mm -hmm. um, and just totally transparent, not only is Newegg itself sensational, they are very open about um, basically trying to decide how candid I should be. Um, <laughs> when you have the opportunity to work with a company like Newegg, you're all of a sudden introduced and kind of hanging out with a lot of other marketing reps for a lot of other different companies because that's what Newegg does, right? Yeah. They, they sell products for a lot of other people. So it's beneficial on many levels. And there were a few people, I think, that really grasped how big a relationship with Newegg was. Um, but most people kind of went over their head. They're kind of like, oh, Newegg, great. But if you study the business model and you're a team manager or you're in a league, whatever, relationships like these – or what you build your future on. So we're super excited to be working with Newegg. They're great people over there. So let's be honest. You get 50% off everything hmm. on the site? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, we don't have like a flat discount. It would be sweet. Oh, damn, I was going to get you to buy me some stuff, dude. <laughs> <laughs> Case uh, very cool, very cool. No. That's the first thing our, our players ask, too. They're like, what can I buy first? Where's my coupon code? They're like, it doesn't work. <laughs> Uh, all right, so um, kind of can't just kind of a you know fun question. So are you are you uh is you, are you pretty much going to be a lifer for esports here? Oh, absolutely, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Um, I may, you know I have worked in different areas in the yeah. past. You know I owned a firm in Atlanta, I had five metro offices, and still ran complexity. Um, you know I may move on and do other things. Right now, past. Three or four months, I've sp I've sat down and spoken with several companies, flown um, San Francisco, met with different companies, because mm -hmm. um, I want to get involved in and do more. I'll always have my heart in complexity. Um, I'll always, you know, God willing, be one of the owners. You know, if we can keep keep the doors open. Um, but there's times and seasons in life, so I see myself probably 
moving on and trying to contribute to the greater scene in in a different capacity. I just haven't figured out exactly where that's going to be. Mm-hmm. Um, I've been very blessed um, after I sold my law firms and moved to L.A. Quick story. I went through to my life where um, I just kind of had an awakening to the importance of being a dad and spending more time with my kids. It was the month of December um, leading up to Christmas and literally from December 1st to like Christmas Eve, I didn't see my kids for maybe a total of 30 minutes because I'd be at my law firm all week and uh, I had three consecutive weekends. I went to New York, Dallas, I went to LA, all for different esports events. And I literally get home on Christmas Eve by the time I get out of the office. And I was just like, I, I can't do this. Um, I don't want to be this kind of father that, you know, great, you live in a nice house, really know who your dad is. Mm-hmm. So after I came out to work at CGS and sold my law firm, um, you know, CGS closed its doors and I was fortunate enough to kind of take time and just spend time um, being a dad and uh, running complexity from home and, you know, attending some events, but I used to attend like everything religiously, but now it's more about my kids. Thankfully, they're both in school now and out of the house um, to where I don't I have a lot of free time during the day. I'll do some work on different things here locally and on complexity, but I'm kind of getting to the point in my life where I'm like, I'm ready to work, you know, 50, 60 hours a week outside the house. Um, yep. It'll all to be in conjunction with being a good dad, but it's time for me to get back on the horse. So <laughs> hopefully this year um, I'll find the right place. I've spoken with really intriguing and compelling brands that are working in the esports space and see if I'm the right fit for them and vice versa and we'll just see where it goes. Okay, yeah, that'd be amazing to see you in, in other capacities because uh, obviously you're experienced and you're, you know, you're a smart guy too, so it'd be, it'd be great to see you do a lot Walter, more too. That requires me to not own complexity. Complexity mm-hmm. is my third. I've got uh, Allie. Your sound's, going out. your sound's going out again. Oh, I think it's Skype. It but, might be, um, yeah. I've got Allie, I've got Jordan, I've got Complexity, and I've made it abundantly clear to everyone I spoke to. I will step down at day-to-day management, but I will not relinquish my ownership shares and Complexity to accept any job because it's just too important to me. Mm-hmm. Well, that's cool. So all you Complexity fans don't have to worry about anything. <laughs> I guess Jason will always be part of that. But, no, that's cool that you, you know, you know thanks for sharing just you know, some of that personal stuff there because, you know, I don't think a lot of people understand I mean, how much of a sacrifice it is. And, you know, John, you know, I have kids. John has kids, you know. Richard, you know, who, who knows about him? But, I, I might, but, have, you know. you might have a couple. Is that what you're saying? Like, it's like that, is it? That is going to be some, like, I'm going to get a, a letter just arrived to my house, like, you know, by the way, you owe this much in back pain. <laughs> oh, that's not- It's like that, is it? Okay. Don't believe everything you've heard about the UK. Like, you know, we, we are civilized people over here. Like, not all of us are, like, you know, just out there, like, fathering legitimate kids and, you know. But we'll, 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 we'll see them later on. 18 years' time. We'll catch up. You know? Awesome. awesome. And on, on, a, on a serious note, like, I don't know how anyone does it with kids, like, esports, I mean. Uh, because, uh, you know, I, I'm having a hard enough time, you know, like in my thirties now, I've been around for a long time, like motivation's a constant problem because, you know, it's very hard to interact with a younger community and um, I, I think as well though, like just everyday life shit, like how am I going to cultivate a relationship to a point where I can actually father a kid if every weekend, you know, I'm actually out like, you know, at, at, at a different event and then through the week I'm hunched over my laptop, you know, like just constantly writing or putting in a 50 60 hour week like people don't realize how pervasive a lifestyle esports is yes. because if you're near a, if you're near a pc or you're near the internet you can be working and people know that and if you're driven you kind of want to be working it's very mm-hmm. hard to kind of get pulled away from that i mean i, I know jason is a, a workhorse i mean like always above and beyond the the call of duty with complexity to help get it you know where it was and where it is now and uh i mean like that sort of dedication it it comes at a cost it it really does and uh you know people don't realize that kind of outside of the esports sphere but again it's like everything if you if you give a one hand generally uh, you're taking you're taking away from something else you know yeah here's props to all the wives and 
significant others out there because the esports yeah, exactly. widows. Oh, my right. Seriously, it's just that's like... what we need to set up the esports widows fund so they can all have oh friends my out, like God. Magic oh, Mike God. on DVD or you know whatever it is they need while you're away at events, right? <laughs> I mean, it is really frustrating, and I, John knows this, and like my partner Jason Bass is married with two kids, and other people that have done the esports life, the esports circuit, um, because I want to be at everything. Like, yeah. I always want to be there, and I make few events, can you know, a year now, and people are like, "Oh my gosh, where are you been?" It's just, you know, it's like you just gotta choose priorities. Like, I still invest a ton of time. Um, my wife was here. She would tell you, you know, I was took a couple my kids to Palm Springs for a couple of days last week for their spring break, and I'm still on my iPad with you know wireless on it and my phone and checking everything and reading everything and. Like you said, it's just it's very hard for somebody um, like me and and like my partner too. When you're watching these events from home and you're seeing things or you're reading things that took place and you're knowing about the networking opportunities you're missing, you know, you know that the, it's just very hard because there's nothing can replace being there. Nothing can replace being at these events and networking and talking to people and and um, it, it's been very tough. We've done a a pretty darn good job in complexity of building kind of a sub management team of people that know our philosophy. They know how we do things. They know what we would do in any given situation. So we've been able to kind of replicate ourselves to a certain extent. Um, but it's still really hard not being there. It's just as you get to be um, older and you get to be a father or, or a mother, you, you have to be like, look, here's my priorities. And sometimes it's going to be tough but you got to stick by it and that, that's just um what both jason bass and i've done and complexity um probably suffers from it um there's probably deals we could have had if i was at all these events um yeah. if i was able to make all these trips or if i didn't have to come home early because my son had a game or whatever i mean just today we had to move the show because my son has a basketball game at 4 15 that i didn't know about and i'm the only one around um this afternoon that could take him um, so you guys are kind enough to move the show, but it's just one of example of thousands that any dad out there would be like, oh, yeah, you know. So uh, it, it's definitely interesting and, and frustrating mm -hmm. um, you, when you know that you could be giving more to something you love so much, but there's just something out there that you love a little bit more. Yeah, I can completely relate, dude. I'm just sure a little John bit. Can too. Just a little bit more. <laughs> I can completely relate. Yeah. Sometimes so. I don't love my 15 year old more than sports. <laughs> See, I don't have teenagers yet, so I don't have to. You know, yeah. I mean, that'd be a different story. It'd be like, oh man. <laughs> uh, here's, here's a question for you, John. Would you would you keep your kids away from from esports? Like, no. I, I I I am honestly like always torn on this question. I get asked all the time, like. You know, when you do have uh, a kid, uh, when I get time to do it, obviously I'm looking forward to that. It's going to be great, no doubt. Um, like, would you would you want your child involved in esports? And I don't know how I'd answer that, man. It changes from day to day. When I'm having a great day, yeah, awesome. When I'm having a bad day, and it's like, okay, I'm not going to open that hotmail account. That's just full of hate mail now. Uh, <laughs> it, it, no, it's an absolute no. So, well, I mean, it's not like I you know pull them into it but I mean they they know I mean my daughter's gonna be home actually she's probably home now and she knows that you know my wife's probably told her you know at four o'clock you can probably run in there and and she knows oh dad you're doing another show tonight or do you have to admin a tournament you know she, she kinda understands it my son of course has grown up for a long time and anybody that plays Xbox games especially Call of Duty in which you're actually online um, you've been exposed to quite a bit of what esports can bring as far as negativity goes. So uh, he's been around it um, for quite some time. He knows what I do, what I do and everything. So, um, but yeah, I mean there are definitely dark sides to it that you may not want to you know bring your kids involved into it. But I mean, I'll probably bring my son to an event this year. I'd like to uh, I'd like to for him to see kind of what what I do on a different level. I'd love to have him go to like uh, an MLG event and, and watch the Call of Duty stuff or even QuakeCon. I'll bring him to QuakeCon and let him sit there for three days in front of the computer in a dark room, you know, with a bunch of other nerds and see what happens. But um, yeah, I, mean, I do it more for experimental reasons, really. I mean, like having your kids involved with like, a, you know, being a attendee and that sort of thing, I mean, that's no different than taking your kids to the ball game, you know what I mean? Or 
a basketball game or anything like that. That's kind of what we want, right? I mean, we, we want, like, father and sons and daughters going together to these events and just enjoying a weekend, right? So, um, yeah, I mean, that, that kind of said the same thing. As a great comment in the Twitch TV chat, by the way, it says, Chris's kids already have 300 APM in StarCraft. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. Can you okay, so so it? truth, truth, guys. My 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 wife will not let my son play StarCraft. There you go, veto. She, she, got veto. she will not let him play, even though he watches it uh -huh. like with me, like and, and everything. She just won't let him play. She'll let him play everything else but StarCraft right now, which is like, <laughs> it's just crazy. Yeah, I mean, but, in my household, my kids oh, are not shooters. Sorry, not shooters. But just. Shooters, no. My kids are completely integrated, and, and at first I was kind of like, maybe I'll, I'll bring them in slow or whatnot, but I think whether your dad's a golfer or a fisherman or he drives a big truck or what, you know, he likes tractors, when you're a little kid, you look up to your dad with like these, you know, big eyes, and you want to be like him, and then you turn a teenager, right, John? But <laughs> you know, So when my kids constantly see me sitting on the computer, and then I'm playing games, and I'm doing things, it just kind of came naturally, and obviously we... You know, he doesn't get to chat on any of these things, and I'm constantly moderating and turning stuff off. When he plays CSGO, I had to turn off the voice chat and all this <laughs> other stuff. But we play all, we play tons of games together. I was trying yeah. to get you a link, but if you go to my Twitter and go to the photos on my Twitter, I don't even know if that's publicly accessible. I'm kind of a Twitter um, newbie. Awesome. But, like, you'll see all the pictures of Jordan and I playing together and Allie, and then we've got Korean pro players in town, and they're, <laughs> they're playing... Uh, games together and then they'll go down to anaheim and hang out with all the pros and this is you know this is the life they lead am i going to force them into anything absolutely not but when they see me so passionate about it and they see me love esports so much as john kid john's kids do you know i would put money on that they're both going to be very good little gamers and you know, Jordan especially, he's probably going to be a pro gamer at something. Um, it's like Tiger Woods grew up playing golf. My kid yeah. grew up on uh, Halo and Counter Strike, and it's a family activity around here. Because uh, you know, I think at the end of the day, as long as we're spending time together and we're bonding over something, yeah. it's and it makes sense too. Of course, there's some things, but it's kind of, you know, it's a little overlap too, right? For you know, so it it makes complete yeah. sense even from a. If, Time well, it's, the, it's off the whole idea of growth and the underbelly. I mean, these kids are going to grow up and they're going to understand what esports is yeah. or what gaming in general is and how it can be competitive. And the sure. more that that happens, um, the more mainstream that it becomes because yeah. um, you don't have to be on TV for this to grow. I mean, we've all established that. You just need to educate people on what it is that we do. I mean, I, I, there was a point where I just was like, I didn't really explain it, what I did. Uh, what I was doing on my weekends and things like that to people that didn't understand it, but now it's it's at a point where I just do it anyway. And there obviously there's still a lot of people that their minds are just blown. I was sitting in class telling telling class one day what, what I did, and this girl was like, "What? This stuff? Ha what? There's actually games that people play, you know, competitively." And her mind was blown. She said, "And um, but you just it, continue to educate people, and that means your kids." Uh, the, the more they're educated, then they grow up, then they tell their buddies, and that just starts the whole process. Right, yeah. right. All right, uh, why don't we take some questions? Kurt's, like, dying to ask a question, so. Oh, no. <laughs> so, uh, you know, why don't we start some Q&A here? And uh, you guys cool with that? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. All right, here sure. we go. If you guys want to ask a question, go ahead and uh, just uh, add me on Skype. Skype is Chime, Chime MV. Kurt says, I have a couple questions that I just have to ask. So, Kurt is Key Hunt, guys, for they don't know. Oh, man, he doesn't even answer. Kurt, are you there? Is he not even answering? What's going on, Kurt? Maybe it's your Skype. All right. Skype. Nope. Can you hear hey, me? Hey, what's up? Yeah, oh, I can hear you he's now. there. Hey, Crap. Right. Oh. <laughs> what's, up, what's up, Kurt? Guys? Everybody doing all right? Good, good. Yes. So, hit, hit us with these questions, man. <laughs> all right. Well, first off, Jason knows that there's very there's few people in the community that I can pretty much ask questions to and, and continuously, but I'm going to try to <laughs> cut it down. You're one, Alex is one, Craig is one. It just in. Um, I got a few that I think will you know or help you know general questions and uh, you know one that's pretty uh, more personal. Um, what I'm wondering is, is you know you and complexity and everybody have been through a lot of ups and downs and 
uh, ups and downs and more ups and downs and sometimes <laughs> more downs than ups. And I'm wondering what scares you, like what worries you with esports now? Like, is there anything in the future that you see as being um, a problem for either you or complexity or just esports in general? I don't, I don't know if this is really scare or worries, but maybe more of a disappoint. One thing that disappoints me is, um, and it's just the nature of this business, the nature of the beast per se, is um, it's you know generally up till now been kind of an age group thing, um, where how do I put this? There's not enough appreciation for the history if that makes sense. And I think probably everybody on this show will agree with me um, to where there have been people, many people that have been laying sidewalk that we get all walked down. We've been laying the runway so this plane could take off. And a lot of times when I read Reddit and stuff and certain names come up or old teams or whatever, it's just people in general um, can be so oblivious it, it kind of takes some of this uh, wind out of my sail sometimes. Um, mm. I don't, I don't want to be e-famous. I don't, I, you know, all that stuff is for the birds. But when I see just such a complete and utter um, lack of knowledge about the history of certain things, it's very disheartening to me. Uh, if that makes any sense, and I think like it makes, it makes guys, perfect you know, like, sense, and you know it, <laughs> like sir scoots and things. You know, there's so many inside jokes now because. Sadly, nobody knows what you're talking about. I mean, how many right. kids that play competitive games never even heard of something as basic as like CPL? Um, how many kids that are really into esports have a clue who Angel Munoz is? Um, and you could, the list goes on and on and on. And it's just like, unlike traditional sports, I think we're kind of unique where a lot of people that were following like say in Counter-Strike in 2004 maybe have moved on and they're busy getting out of college and getting their job and getting married and a lot of these kids were like six years old so why would they care or even understand how certain games in Starcraft and Counter-Strike and Quake all kind of you know convalesced to make what we have now and in being an old timer that's just I don't know disheartening it's it makes me sad I don't know if it's being scared about anything but you know I've mentioned several times I'm a huge history buff and I can watch history channel all day and if you don't learn from the past and the mistakes of the past and the old phrase you're going to repeat them so if there's no young leaders out there that know our history um, are we ever going to get anywhere are we just going to keep paving the runway and never take off just uh, I mean, following on from that Jason before we go to Kurt's next question though, what about people who like They've got the history, but actually it's not that much to it, and they kind of dine out on this like one little thing that they did. Can you think of uh, oh, Can you think of any guys like that in esports, maybe? Oh, Richard, I love you, man. <laughs> <laughs> hey, man, like, I, I'm just saying. There's I a think that's type natural. Type you, you, you get old, you know. I still have friends that talk about our exploits in high school football, and we're all state players and stuff. And every time I see them, they want to talk about high school football because that was like their one moment. Prime, you know, their prime. Uh, we <laughs> yeah. we share the stories. <laughs> it's like do you tell all your friends. No, I, you know, I loved it back then, but it's you know I don't talk about it anymore. But <laughs> I guess it's part of getting old. Oh man! So I, I had a follow up question too to what you were talking about. Um, is this so much just the education part of it or just a respect part of of you know folks just not knowing the history yeah it's a mix of of not knowing and a mix of not giving a damn mm -hmm. i think okay. the not giving a damn is much more concerning to me than the not knowing because right. if you give a damn you can always learn right yeah, yeah. it's these yeah. that come in and they're like look i only play ABC game. I don't care about anything. I don't care anything that got here. This is the only game in the world. They've got blinders on. They don't care. You know, somebody who deserves respect, somebody who's put in their time, gets mentioned in a conversation like, who the hell is that? I don't give a crap. That was for, you know. Right, right. I think as you get older, that stuff bothers you when you're young and just like... <laughs> That's the first thing that came to mind with this question. So. Right. Hey, I mean, it, it comes to my mind daily when reading Reddit or anything else, sir. I know it comes to yours. Um, another quick question is one of, one of the honestly one of the things that shaped 
um, how I viewed esports for a long time was the Team 3D COL rivalry, rivalry. And I think most people from CS at least would agree. Do you worry that there are no more rivalries? Like, and I'm talking about um, there's there's rivalries within teams and within games, but within with with a full do, organizational rivalry. I do a bit, um, and that is one of the things to be completely transparent that I really don't necessarily like about StarCraft. Um, mm-hmm. When you get a one v one game, people are gonna fall in love with and follow players and yeah. that's great that's, it's its own kind of thing i i personally kind of come from the team background john was talking about it earlier you love a team or follow a team or root for a team versus a region when we talked about that um it, it's a little disappointing to me but i just think it's natural you know when you get 1v1 games you kind of follow your favorite player and you might not care if he's on complexity or liquid or eg or fanatic or whatever because that's your player you'll cheer for that team while he's there the minute he's gone I don't care about that team mm-hmm. anymore. And that's not good or bad. I just think it's different um, than the team model. Because, like, when I follow Call of Duty now, I mean, these kids get behind Optic and stuff. And God forbid you say the slightest bad thing about Optic, <laughs> you will get 3,000 tweets at you. And <laughs> they will be so mad and burning down your house. And um, so there's still, like, team rivalry, team support and rivalries um, in team based games. But I think. Um, you know, for the most part, when you have a lot of one v one games, uh, or like StarCraft, that's dominated the scene for a couple of years, you won't see it as much. Uh, but if you ask League of Legends players about uh, Solomed versus CLG, or you know, Curse versus, you know, and it it could get pretty heated. I think it's yeah. still there, but many of us have been kind of in the StarCraft universe where. In the West, at least, like TL versus EG is probably the best storyline, and even then, it's kind of. I don't, I don't really know how it. that could be a storyline anymore. Like, what do you mean? They're like partners now. <laughs> yeah, like, I don't know how that's still a story. You know what I'm saying? It has, it's like, oh, they're going to battle it out. they got these yeah. great personalities and intriguing players. But I just think of the 1v1 game, it's much harder to have. Yeah. If yeah. Um, if we ever get a real big FPS to come along again, I, you know, I think you'd see more of a complexity 3D rivalry of old pop-ups somewhere. Well, it's, it's really hard going, to... Yeah, sorry, I was just going to say as well, it's real hard to foster these kind of rivalries in a kind of industry where we're, we're applying this so much importance on this almost like faux respect, like, you know, where it's like you have to kind of, you can't say anything bad about anyone. So it's very hard to have a rivalry with someone if you can't smack talk, right? Mm-hmm. Because then you just get, you know, BM, BM, whatever, right? So, I mean, there has to be some sort of leeway. But I, I do think it's a shame. We've got this very, on like, sanitized approach to rivalries now like i mean i see it in lcs all the time where it's like every game they try and hype it up like it's a mega rivalry and it's like it's not a rivalry these guys like each other they're living together playing with each other they don't really care who wins just as long as the gravy train keeps rolling let's not (laughs) pretend it's not the same as counter-strike was when it was do or die right like it Mm -hmm. actually meant something and people went wild about who won and who lost you know i guess it's kind of like UFC in a way, right? I mean, mm. those guys really don't hate each other for the most part. They're, it's more no. a show, right, than anything. Well, it's okay to have mutual respect, but um, you know, especially since you're playing in the same game. But I agree. I'd love to see a lot more. Just you know, my name, my team is better than your team, or at least my, well, you know, my jersey looks better than yours. Well, you sucks. You it, know, I just it, want to it, see more of it'd that. It'd be a lot different, John. It'd be a lot different, John, <laughs> like, if, uh, if there was Call of Duty, man. <laughs> if the, if there were parity in the t- like the you know the t- like infrastructure of the teams and the support you know the t- it's not a it's not a neat, you know it's not a fair game right now between all the t- you know the teams are all at different places you know mm-hmm. and so it uh, it's hard to actually oh my team's better than yours well, you, well that's probably true the, <laughs> you know I don't know biggest, you know it's like I don't the know you know rivalries it's, 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 in esports it's, right now are all about games like, the most yeah. passionate rivalries are like you know it's League of Legends versus Dota you know it's like uh, Counter Strike versus yeah. Call of Duty, or 1.6 versus CS:GO. The mm-hmm. most passionate rivalries all stem from what game you play. That's what people probably identify with the most these days, and that's what gets people riled the most, rather than yeah, you know a true. brand, an organization, a team, a player, whatever you want to call it. It's if you are part of that community, you get to you know trash talk other communities. Which is yeah, my worry of of developers getting too involved and fragmenting the. Uh, the, the overall industry of esports. Then then it just becomes my game is better than your game and then 
you know, one game dies out or the developer pulls pulls funding, now all of a sudden the other community just gets to laugh their asses off at the other, you know, at that, at that community and say, ha-ha, <laughs> see? Yeah. I just remember Godfrag threads going on for days, you know, with Go 3D, Go COL, Go 3D, Go COL, and then, that, you know, go, a, few, a few Go JMCs thrown in there for good measure, but it, that's what it was, you know? So I, I miss it. Um, I miss it a lot. But anyway, I could go on forever, but I'm going to ask one last question that's a kind of <laughs> more of a personal one. All right, one. last one. All right. This is a question I've wanted to ask for a long time, and I don't know if you would have answered it until recently. Um, oh, boy. Uh-oh. How – well, I'm not going to get too mean with it, but I, <laughs> I, I was just thinking the other day about the SIVO leak, SIVO, the, the infamous SIVO meeting leak mm-hmm. for people that don't know what I'm talking about. You know, you can probably Google it. You're getting it. really obscure for this audience. <laughs> I am, I know, but I have to. I have to ask. The oh, a lot of people, you know, considered that a conspiracy theory for a long time, and they were a conspiracy conspiracy theory. But I want to know just how big that was for you when it happened, and how pissed you were. You know, I, I really, I just want to know because at the time, whenever I mean, would ask you or ask Charlie Plitt, it would be like all public relations. <laughs> you know. It wasn't, you know, it was a private conversation basically taped and leaked, and it wasn't ideal by any stretch of the imagination, (laughs) but I try not to to burn bridges just across, you know, a little puddle, and I knew Charlie and I were going to be friends and, and, you know, uh, colleagues for many years, so a little slap on the wrist or in many many I'm sorry is on his end and it was I'd, over I'd say switching the source is more than a puddle but <laughs> 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 but anyway man I, I appreciate it guys okay you great bet. thanks thanks Kurt thanks Kia yeah. alright let's see Nick Nico Schneider has a question he doesn't have a mic so he, he would normally have called in he says how important is it for an organization to have personalities especially in StarCraft. Is it more important to have players who win and stay in the shadows or to have people who aren't doing that good but have personalities and egos? <laughs> so it's an EG one. question, right? <laughs> it's an evil genius's question, is it? I see. <laughs> hey, man, some of those guys um, win too. I mean, the easy, answer, <clears throat> the easy answer is you want both. Um, I've always kind of, being a purist, if you study my... Counter, I keep going back to Counter Strike because that's really when I had the most minute by minute, you know, hands in any team we've ever had, and in, in developing and helping the guys and growing it. Um, but if you study that team, I didn't care if they were good looking. I didn't care if they had, you know, some awesome podcast personalities. I just want to kick everybody's ass. Um, nowadays, I think just because we are at our heart. Um, to stay financially viable we are at our heart marketing agencies Um, so there has to be some personality if you've got a bunch of winners that are just drab and uh, they're standing there holding a trophy companies don't really want to pay money for that tiger woods and michael jordan got the big bucks not only because they were successful but because they were compelling personalities and in real sports you'll see some people that are better you know they either look better and maybe they speak better they'll get better endorsement deals than somebody who's statistically better on the basketball court for example I, it's just the world we live in i think you need a little bit of both um in a per- my perfect world it would be about hey let's go see who can win the person that win gets all the all the crowns and all the prizes but i, I do think you need some some both Okay, great. Uh, let's see, Steve here is just posting a question. So you guys talked about segregation for a long for a long time earlier, from the angle of race and regionalization. But what about gender? There's been a couple of big female-only tournaments recently. I know Richard will, will be aware of the Copenhagen Games Woman Tournament. Uh, to break that down into a question, since yeah. women in general don't seem to have any physical or mental disadvantage in esports, as could be argued in some real-world sports, what do you think... When do you think of it being mixed in females? Um, question mark. Does it create further segregation, or is it necessary to attract girls to gaming? Well, I'm no, for me. Or for Richard, you want to take that one? No, look, there's, look, there's no way to talk about the issue of gender, right, in, in uh, esports without coming across like a sexist dinosaur. Like Rachel will be on my case no matter what I say again. Twitter's gonna blow up, right? So, look, I'll just. Say I, I get it. Well, it's like. 
Yeah. Okay, go go ahead. No, no, I'll, I'll I'll just say what I think most what I think most people think, even the people who don't want to say it think, and that is that one of the cool things about esports um, is that it is a great leveler. I I, I think that uh, you know. Certainly, with physical sports, uh, we are even and even in physical sports, we're starting to see boundaries being broken. There was a uh, a female kicker going for an NFL draft recently. Yeah. She got injured and didn't make it, and blah blah blah. But whatever. So we're starting to see those physical boundaries uh, come down a little bit anyway. But like in esports, they aren't necessarily there. And I'm, I'm not going to try and go into the pseudo science of it like a lot of people do and talk about left brain hemisphere and right brain. You know, I'm not going to do any of that. Uh, just on the surface of it, what I see. There's no theoretical reason why uh, a female gamer can't get to the top uh, of, of, of an eSports mm -hmm. tree. Now, I understand that it's not exactly a great environment to, to come into for uh, a female because, you know, a lot of the guys that play in the online community haven't even seen a girl before, haven't even, let alone <laughs> into with one or have their ass kicked by one on a deathmatch server or whatever so obviously it is going to be a hostile environment and it's going to be unpleasant for them you know and I, I, I totally get that and that sucks and that definitely needs to change but again if we take away the kind of virgin stroke nerd component of esports we're going to lose a big part of our demographic there's no getting away from it so uh, it needs to be a process of education and enlightenment right so to, to get there, how do we create that education and enlightenment? Do we create education and enlightenment through segregation? History tells me no, that's not a cool thing to do. So uh, what we should be doing is we should be saying to all the sponsors that want to fund girls-only tournaments, which, by the way, if you've ever seen a girls-only tournament, they're disgusting. They are disgusting. They basically make the, you know, the organization to make the girls dress up, make them wear low-cut tops or hot pants, pink zinich. Again, the Counter-Strike team springs to mind. They're doing, like, nudie calendars and stuff. Like, come on, right? Like, this isn't about competitive esports. It, it's actually... It's no actually debasing. It's yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. It's actually debasing the women that want to, to, to have the right to compete, and, and, and they shouldn't buy into that. The, the teams I would respect and the individuals I would respect are the people who would come into a, a, a male orientated tournament environment and just try it, try, you know, give it their best shot. And eventually, over time, they're going to get better and better. And, and eventually, it's not out of the question that we're going to see females, you know, start to place at events. So I've yeah. never been. I, look, I support females in gaming. I don't support female gaming, and I think there is a distinction people need to make. So, so Jason, you guys have have you guys ever had a female player on your roster or in any game? Oh um, goodness, you know, I don't believe we've had a rostered female. Oh yeah, yeah, sure. In CGS, we had a female because there's a female um, versus female division uh, for dead, uh, dead or alive. Dead and I'm trying. I, I'm trying to think. Because, goodness, I don't want to miss somebody and hurt somebody's feelings. I don't believe we've had a female roster, like, starter um, in traditional games that we've played. No. Okay. It's okay. not, like you said, I'm not against it at all. Um, mm -hmm. To be honest, on from a business side, I would love if some beautiful young lady came up in any of the popular games and started kicking everybody's butt and wanted to oh, play yeah. for complexity. I could, not, <clears throat> I could market that. Do you see what I'm saying? Yeah, it's unique. Um, if she's got a good personality, um, if she's attractive in your world um, class um, StarCraft II player, that's marketable. I'm sorry. It's it's marketable. She's going to make more money. Um, complexity would make more money. It's just the world we live in. Yeah. I have zero bad things to say about women in esports. I welcome them. Absolutely. I hope we could see some champions. I think there's great storylines that we're missing out on. Um, why exactly, like Richard said, why they don't, why females generally don't take the video games or competitive video games as much as males is a probably a whole new show. <laughs> but I would have them in, and I would not bat an eye if there was uh, you know, a really good female player in a game. I would love to have her on board. Yeah, it's purely a numbers thing right now. I mean, there's just so. I mean, I don't even know what the ratio is, but the ratio is just ridiculous. You know, male, male to female ratio in gaming right now. So. Um, Esports is a sausage fest, Chris. There's no <laughs> doubt about it. Like, Newsflash, yeah. right? Yeah, that's true. That's true. And that's too bad because I, I don't know. I, I'm a supporter of, of, of um, female leagues and that sort of thing. Just to, as a growing point. It's a kind of the same thing as the whole regionalization thing. It's, it's a place to, to cultivate something. And then, you know, maybe 
you know, kind of grow it to what I think we all would 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 want. Um, but uh, yeah. So, anyways, yeah. So, Jason, ten, ten minutes. Ten minutes. We gotta go, guys. So, uh, let's see. <laughs> well, let's I've see. got about ten minutes for. Um, I've got to run out. But um, okay, cool. Uh, why don't we? Uh, why don't we take one more quick one and then we'll. Uh, uh, actually, do we even have another? Is there one in chat, John? Do you know? Uh, maybe we maybe we can call it there. We'll, uh, well, there was there was one question that was specific to Richard. Uh, we had talked about we'd asked Jason if he was an esports lifer. Yeah. So a couple of people were wondering if if Richard was the same way. What his thoughts on on uh, if he was an esports lifer? If he was going to keep I, doing this? I look this. at guys like Jason and like I want to say yes. But uh, I, I don't know. Like I, 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 I'm not like him. Like he's got a very thick skin, and uh, and and I think he's got qualities about him that make him certainly a lot more likable than than, than my personal qualities uh, in, in the broader context. Yeah, bromance. Uh, um, <laughs> uh, uh, but yeah, so I, I don't know if I can say I'm a lifer really. Like I got so many things I want to do outside of esports, and I. Fell into esports by accident. I, I, you know, I got I fell into esports because literally I, 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 I just uh, got kind of laid off from from another newspaper, and I just wanted to keep writing and 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 see what happened. And and the rest is kind of a decade's worth of terrible history. So, <laughs> um, so I don't know. I don't know if I can say I'm a lifer. But then again, if you'd asked me in 2004, like would I still be doing it now in 2013? I'd have probably said you'd be out of your mind. So, you know, I, I think it's one of those things. In the same in the same way, it's pervasive. It's kind of addictive as well. It's very hard to kind of give up. Like I, I don't know what I would do with all the free time. So, who knows? But uh, I've definitely got other plans. Cool, cool. All right. Well, why, why don't we wrap things up, uh, Jason? It's been a pleasure. I think we just it kind of we ended up have, being just more of a just chill more. and just you know talk and that's what's really cool about having you on is that I knew, I think I knew we could just have a nice you know pretty just laid back and you know just shoot the shit type of Absolutely. <laughs> conversation yeah, but um, Absolutely. uh you have any shout outs thank you you want to do at this point oh thank you very much um for having me on and um it's an honor to be on your 50th episode and you know <laughs> Chan I will tell you one thing you are a very persistent uh <laughs> <laughs> show host um we you have probably hit me up 300 times in the last eight months oh and come on now you're making me sound like now you're making me sound like a stalker or something maybe dude. that's an exaggeration <laughs> no 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 it wasn't it wasn't like that it was always like yeah. oh maybe i can do it was my bad is what i'm getting at and it's like oh i can't make it oh i gotta be out of town and you know i i i'm sorry it took so long and i really That's am happy cool. to have been on the show and thank you very much um thank you to uh the other hosts john and uh of course my bromance buddy good luck on the show and um <laughs> thanks to our sponsors of complexity that make everything happen sound blaster uh, new egg origin pcs pny creative twitch QPad, GA Clothing, and Nation Voice. Nice. <laughs> no, nice. but uh, I say it with a chuckle, but I mean it sincerely. Um, there would be no complexity if it wasn't for those guys. So mm. thank you, and please consider supporting the companies that support mine. Thanks again, guys. Good deal. Thank you, awesome. Jason, yeah. for coming on. Exactly. Thank you again. Finally. And hopefully we'll do it again some soon. And, uh, and guys, watch, watch The Executives. Awesome, awesome show. And it's like, I feel like our shows are kind of along the same lines, you know, so... I mean, just not along the same lines, but just the same demographic of people. I guess we target. So, uh, definitely check his his show out whenever um, it's on. It's usually hey. on Wednesdays, right? I think that's whenever. It, it's on. Yeah, you know, we've we've had a terrible track record the last few months um, for the same reasons it took me so long to get on your show. Yeah. Um, Odie, when Odie's traveling, I'm not. When I'm traveling, <laughs> yeah, Odie's not. And hotel right. in that in t- biz during the time of the day and then we had a new co-host that we were going to announce and then he was it's just been like i'm to the point where i still think there's value in the show but i'm just going to make them when we get a chance to make them because it's the executives is mainly about the vod archives Mm -hmm. um so i've been a little frustrated this year it's like dude it's been like two months two and a half months since we've had a show odio's in la for a month with this league team and always busy and then i was out of town but um, yeah, definitely check out the VODs, and we'll try to get some more episodes up at some point this year. Yeah, definitely. Those VODs are really good. They go through a lot of, you know, just I always keep thinking of the Kurt like proposal one. That's a really good one. Like the recent, one of the recent ones. Um, yeah, it was good. 
yeah, you did a great job. Great. Uh, Richard, you want to do uh, your shout outs? I don't need to. I'm I'm an established member of the uh, the show now. Oh, we so always do shout outs. We still do uh, shout outs. Really? Do we yeah. do shout outs? We do. Oh, yes, God. we do. Do you not Does remember the last time I was change. on as a guest and I said yeah. I hate doing shout outs. I find I find them so bad. Thank you. So like, thank you. How about thank uh, you? I'd like to thank you for uh, choosing me as a co-host because <laughs> not you actually had not. no choice. You were the last one left. <laughs> John, why are you ruining my secrets? With, who turned you down? Like, that's what I <laughs> it, it must have been hey, real. John wanted a wingman twin, remember? <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Man. That's a pretty small <laughs> demographic, right there. Yeah. But no, like I, I, I think I think it's going to be uh, awesome, uh, you know. And I, I, I've said uh, I'm I'm looking at kind of moving out of Counter Strike after uh, all this time because I just. That community just sickens me on a daily basis. So oh, no. um, I'm just Here looking forward to like doing more in StarCraft and and you know across emerging titles. I want to get involved yeah. in Smite and, and and titles like this that I think need a push and would benefit from having experienced heads make a contribution. So um, I, I think this is a big part in my uh, renaissance, uh, renaissance, climbing the ladder. There you go. Good deal. Well, welcome aboard. Yeah, welcome aboard, buddy. Definitely some fun weeks ahead. John, you want to do shots? Uh, yeah, I'm tired. Uh, <laughs> All right. Well, shout out to you guys, and I always uh, thank uh, thank the fans, thank those that showed up and and watched today, and and uh, you know if you felt like you got something out of this out of the show today, de you know definitely spread the word um, because we do put up vods as well and MP3 versions of it, and you know you can listen while you're in the car or whatever. But um, yeah, the, so definitely a, a thanks to all those that tuned in. Uh, thanks for Richard for accepting the uh, the invite to be a part of the show now, and uh, that was good. Uh, and a uh, shout out to to my guys at uh, at IGL that are working. We now have three coders just working their tails off in trying to get um, a lot of what we want done um, put together. So a uh, shout out to those guys and the uh, and the and all the admins that are trying to. To get their foot in the door in all these communities, including Smite, uh, is one of the communities we're looking to to get involved in. So, shout out to all of those guys, and as always, to you, Chris, for putting on a great show each week. Uh, my shout out is just going to round it up. Just you know, big thanks to the three of you guys for having you know do a great episode, and obviously the two of you guys for. Uh, Continue. We're going to continue on and, and do some great things. Um, big shout out to my mods, obviously for uh, just every week for for man in the chats and uh, just all you guys, you know, viewers for watching just every week and supporting the shows. Um, Unfilter is going to be on in a at in about an hour. So I, I got these double headers like on Thursdays now, so it's going to be crazy. Man, um, I know. I'm just crazy. I just. <laughs> sometimes I just sometimes I just shake my head like what the hell, Chris? <laughs> but, that, 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 <laughs> what was I thinking when I did all this? Yeah, <laughs> that, that's the but, uh, I tanked this one. That's what you did. So yeah, I'm right. Gonna... No, no. But, <laughs> um, uh, but oh. yeah. So anyway, so Unfair is going to be on in an hour, and um, and that's about it. Yeah. So vods for this is going to they're going to be up later tonight at youtubecom shamanv. Follow us all on Twitter, twittercom shamanv, twittercom slash uh, is it ES underscore John Clark? ES underscore John Clark. And then yeah. and then at Richard Lewis, right? Is Richard A. Lewis or Richard Lewis? I forget. Richard Richard underscore A underscore Lewis because all go. the cool Richard Lewis is a <laughs> uh, twist. So. And then uh, Twitter.com slash uh, call underscore lake for, for Jason here. But yeah, that's going to be it for Climbing the Ladder this week. Oh, actually, I do end up... Oh, I have the credits now. I gotta, uh oh, I'm going to have to add the credits here. Hold on. Give me a second. Congrats on 50 episodes, though, guys. Sincerely, that's great. Keep it up. Definitely, yeah. definitely. We're, we're planning something pretty, uh, pretty special for um, uh, for one year. So one year's coming up in a couple weeks. Oh no, it's green. It's green. It's green. <laughs> Fancy. Oh, it's green. Oh See, man. People are bad. asking, so I'll tell them <laughs> your your unfiltered show with Destiny. And that's the name of it. So people are asking, like, when's the next show with Destiny? Uh, no, it's, it's called screening. Unfiltered, and it's coming up in an hour from now. Is that right? Yeah. Oh, how are we good? I can change the damn thing. <laughs> All right. No, 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 no. Okay. You got. You guys caught the credits that way. It's like, oh man, I'm gonna have to fix it next week. But uh, but anyways, that's gonna be it for climbing the ladder this week. It's for uh, John, for uh, Chairman V, John Clark, Richard Lewis, and Jason Lake. We'll see you next time. All right. Later. Thanks. Peace. Thanks.